News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. And very good evening to you and a warm welcome to Newsline Live, the first program of 2023. This is for, in case you're interested in the statistics, this is the uh, eighth year. Uh, well, we finished seven and we are now going. In July it will be eight years. But uh, we're delighted to do this program and uh, we're delighted that you continue to watch us and send us your questions as always on 0772 300 305 SMS or WhatsApp. Thank you. And uh, our first guest for this uh, year is no stranger to the program, uh, attorney at law, former Human Rights Commissioner Ambika Satkuranadan. Very good evening to you, Ambika Satkuranadan. Good evening, Faraz. Thank you very much for coming on the program. I was going to ask you, uh, the theme of uh, today's program is credibility is king. How, as a, you know, um, a sort of de facto kind of watchdog of what goes on in our country in terms of human rights, not only of human rights, mm. and, and as attorney at law, how would you rate Sri Lanka's, Sri Lanka's government credibility on a scale of 1 to 10? Well, I'm not sure because, um, you know, in order to rate that, we need to do um, extensive uh, polling. But mm. I would say, you know, from what you see uh, about uh, the standard of people's lives, mm. we have inc increasing food insecurity. Mm. There are studies which say that there is malnutrition of children not uh, attending school, of dropping out of school because they can't afford. Children uh, fainting. F children fainting in school because yeah. they have not hid, uh, eaten at home. We know ourselves, we know people who are struggling to make ends meet, particularly mm. people like daily wage earners, women heads of households, people who have already been marginalized. And if you're looking at credibility, let's take the, the IMF bailout package. And we were told that it would be negotiated by the end of the year, but mm. now we're into 2023, that hasn't still happened. Happen. So the question is why and is the government focusing enough on resolving the issues at hand or are they do they have a plan is the plan short medium and long term because you can have 25 year old plan right for the next 25 years but if you don't have a plan for the next three months six months and 12 months how will you address the urgent needs of the people the existential needs of the people it is not about lighting up the um, you know, what is it, the Lotus Tower or cable cars, etc. Well, they light the Lotus Tower, but they turn off the lights on the highway. I the did airport. notice that uh, just a few days ago that the, the you know, taking the highway from the airport, notice that all the lights were switched off. And that is very important for safety, but the lights are off and the lights are on uh, at the Lotus Tower. So I think that is a great metaphor for the fact that the government does not seem to be focusing its time, resources and energy on what matters and it's still flailing haplessly. It's kind of a hit and miss approach that we see. Um, but uh, um, Ambika, um, some people uh, in Colombo um, and a few whom I met in Jaffna as well actually, they sort of said, well, things are a bit better now, aren't they? And I said, why? So there's no fuel queue. Yeah. I, I, I said, but, you know, you have to understand this in the context. Sri Lanka is a country that is not servicing its loans. They've, in essence, declared bankruptcy in terms of that. Now, the key thing here is to get a plan and to get your all the lenders to agree on the exactly. size of the haircut and so on. But instead of doing that, and they're using this money, because there is a certain amount of money after all the country, uh, and so they're providing us with limited quantities of fuel, mm -hmm. because it's rational. Mm -hmm. So aren't we living a lie? There is no credibility in this thing that's going on. Uh, that is one. And secondly, I noticed, I couldn't help but notice, and, I, and this is nothing uh, anti-anything, mm -hmm. but I, I, I state what I saw. We have a president who's on holiday, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. The country is bankrupt. You go on holiday? I don't think you should. But anyway, he's on holiday for so many days. The country owes $33 billion around. And he's announcing that he's given away 30 acres for something or other. Come on. That 30 acres, giving it away, should be the job of some district secretary or provincial secretary or chief minister or something like that. There is no need. The optics are wrong. That's what I'm trying to say. That's but what I'm trying to say. It goes beyond the optics. And, it, and examples like the ones you have uh, spoken about show the uh, crisis of governance, the fact that our systems and processes are deeply dysfunctional. We have an executive who is focusing or who is trying to exercise powers that need to be exercised by a provincial or a local government uh, officer. And that is because our our political culture is based on patronage because we have no accountability and people don't also know the notion of public service for example look at the employees of the CEB who said that they would go on strike if they were not provided their bonuses and at a time of crisis they're demanding bonuses when we have uh, you know um, power cuts and we've had uh, we still have a fuel crisis because if we didn't have a fuel crisis, we would not be limited to 20 liters a day. And Absolutely. as you said, people in Colombo, because these are visible, the fuel queue, the power cuts are visible and they're visible to everyone, including those in Colombo, the privileged people. It's the invisible things that happen that are not seen because people don't see malnutrition because they don't see people who can't feed their children because they don't see children fainting in schools they don't see children dropping out of school it is not a problem for them and which comes back to the public Mm. The lack of a civic consciousness, right, and lack of civic responsibility, where we think as long as we are okay, it really doesn't matter, and the and the lack of uh, empathy mm. with those who are suffering. And believe me, there are many suffering. One just has to step out of one's cocoon of privilege to see this. Um, <clears throat> I wonder whether you know, in because we have all these crises, we've got. The, it's all, the heart of it all is the dollar crisis, which led to an economic crisis, which led to a political crisis, Araglay and so on. And today we have got several other crises. We've got the interest rate crisis, we've got the tax rate crisis, we've got the food availability, the food inflation. Okay, it's come down now, but it's still high. Um, the brain drain is, you know, it's another thing. Yeah. But. I also noticed that um, uh, the the tourist, the fledgling tourist industry, is even more challenged because I've spent several hours trying to get onto eta.gov.lk and it ain't working because <laughs> I tried it myself because a potential visitor to the country called me in frustration. So what do I do? All these things are there. It mm. indicates to me that. The president is actually telling us the truth. He has no plan. He said that, Gerald Ratner or not, he said it. Mm -hmm. And he said, and frankly, I don't think we should have a plan. But he says at the same tongue in cheek, literally, but I want to rebuild the economy, sort of fruition 2050. So what do we do now? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, what people have been demanding... <laughs> I'm glad that uh, you're finding it difficult to answer the question. <laughs> yes, what should we do now? Well, what people have been demanding is also a government that is not to be, you know, the old government, as it were. They are demanding elections, which mm. we can have in March. They are asking f to uh, have the opportunity to elect people who... Uh, can be held accountable because the problem right now is the people in the positions of power the president and the prime minister mm. and you know members of the cabinet all seem to think that they're entitled to this that if they're questioned they uh, hit back 
lack, the arrogance, the refusal to answer to the public, although they are public servants. And hopefully in the next election, I think what people need to do is to elect different kinds of people to positions of power. Mm. And for that, we also need to do, particularly the opposition, for instance, needs to do a lot of uh, mobilization at the community level, a lot of political um, awareness raising. Mm. Because I think in the rural areas, uh, many who are in power now, who we think are violent, who are corrupt, who through, through chairs and Bibles and mm. whatnot in mm. Parliament, mm. still have a lot Chili of support. Powder. Chili powder, broke microphones, you know, poured water on the speaker's chair, still have a lot of public support because our political culture is based on patronage. And people who benefit from the patronage do not want to elect someone different, do not want to do things the proper way. They also like the entitlement. So when people are invested in a corrupt, dysfunctional, politicized system, mm. Faraz, no one will want to change it. Absolutely. But, um, you know, I, I keep going on about this. Credibility is key. It really is key because in this uh, world of complexities and challenges, especially here in Sri Lanka, people will be looking for credibility. And hopefully, like what you said, you know, at the next time when it's time to vote, perhaps people will uh, sort of pay attention to that. Um, my colleague uh, Shami Rasuddin used to uh, remind us constantly during the bond scam coverage uh, that um, John Exter, the first governor of the Central Bank of uh, Sri Lanka, um, said that if your integrity has been questioned, you have no place in the Central Bank. And I think that if we were to extend that if your if there if your integrity has been questioned you shouldn't be seated and offering yourself up for election that way we will not have yesterday's rapists and murderers as today's lawmakers it's completely unacceptable, but it happens right here in Sri But that's also because of the political culture. We see, for instance, um, you know, people at the local level who are who are engaged in uh, criminal activities, organized crime, they have links with politicians. And because of the patronage, the politicians give them tickets to contest in the local government elections. Through by getting elected, then they come to provincial, then they get into parliament. This does not mean that they let go of their side businesses. That too continues with political patronage. And then you find that the government itself bemoans criminality, right? And wants to bring about very punitive laws, wants start implementing the death penalty but mm. who it will if affect are the marginalized and the poor because these things thrive and they happen because they have the patronage of those in political power that is indisputable but you know uh, let's see have we got enough time being may do what about this business of the um, presidential pardon you know doesn't that sort of almost, doesn't the judiciary suffer a slap in their face when we have a president who will overrule what they've done? I mean, I know this business about having a opt-out clause just in case there's a miscarriage of justice and so you need to have the last, you know, the buck stops here kind of thing. But is that system working? Is there a system in which the president gives the debt uh, sort of a um, waiver of the death penalty? Well, there is the death penalty itself, uh, sorry, the um, pardon itself yeah. is not a bad thing, mm. right? And as you rightly said, it's also to correct in case there are miscarriages of justice. Mm. And there is a certain system in place, but it does not have adequate checks and balances. It is not transparent and it is not subject to judicial review. So, for instance, when we, when uh, Sunil Ratnaika was granted a presidential pardon. He killed a number of civilians, including a five-year-old child. And uh, my petition was one of the petitions uh, that challenged his pardon. There were four altogether, four petitions filed in the Supreme Court. Did you get a result out of it? And no, not yet. And um, so my, uh, my argument was that we need to have 
uh, a proper system and process that is transparent, that is also subject to judicial review. India is a good example where the Supreme Court actually laid out guidelines in relation to this and said that it needs to be subject to judicial review. And that is something that I requested. And this once again also comes to the executive and the fact that we do have an all-powerful executive, mm. which also goes to that sense of entitlement that the president seems to have, where they don't like to be questions, where they're dismissive, also because they're very confident of the power that they have that yeah. allows them to function in such an unaccountable way, and that trickles down for us. And on, on that note, let's go for a quick break and take a peek at this evening's headline news. I'm going to come back by reading a message I've just received from one of you, our viewers. It is absolutely spot on and to the point. See you on the other side of the break. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. TV One, TV for life. President leads the public sector in officially commencing duties for the new year. Sri Lankan monks seek Dalai Lama's visit and blessings to overcome economic crisis. Electricity workers threaten with trade union action if tariffs are increased. Talks between professionals and state finance minister on income tax conclude without a decision. Student union leader arrested for damaging education ministry gate. UNP and SLPP in talks of forming a possible alliance. TV One, TV for life. News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. And welcome back to Newsline Live from the studios in Dawson Street in Columbia, the News First studios. My guest tonight, Ambika Satkunanadan. This is the message I'm going to read out. I've got it from one of our viewers. Ms. Satgudanadan is exactly right. Government cannot think right because their integrity is questionable. The heads of parties keep on appointing corrupt people because they too are corrupt. These type of political crabs can never walk straight. Boil them in boiling water, but don't eat because the eater too may begin to walk like a crab. I think this this viewer has captured the essence and the spirit of the program pretty well. Do you agree? <laughs> well, I'm not for, you know, uh, the capital punishment. I'm not for the death penalty, so I can't say I agree with okay. you. Okay, Let, let's actually, let's talk about the death sentence and uh, the growing menace of drugs. Yes, let's talk about them. Is it related? Do you think we need to kill, to... to sentence all these people to death and then will the drug menace go away well right now in sri lanka if you possess two grams or more of heroin or cocaine then you can um be and certain other drugs you can be sentenced to death it's sentenced to death or to life imprisonment but we do not carry out the death sentence we've had a moratorium on the death penalty since 1976. Mm. now we need to actually abolish the death penalty and why do i say this i don't say this because i support drug traffickers i don't say this because i want crime to increase i say this because mm. the death penalty does not work and that is evidence from other Doesn't contexts. Work because because you know when you uh, you people assume that by sentencing people to death that it will act as a deterrent. But we have seen that in many offenses, in many cases, people don't actually think these things through. And also there is this myth 
that there are so many drug traffickers in prison. Actually, there aren't, not even on death row. The majority of people on death row, we in Sri Lanka also have a death row, mm. the majority of people on death row are those who are in for murder. And many of them, a large number of them, are people who are first-time offenders, who have never been to prison, mm. you know, where it's been a crime of passion, etc. You do not get a large number of, you know, uh, dr uh, drug traffickers on death death row. So it does not act as a deterrent. Secondly, it is an inhumane punishment. Thirdly, uh, and the reason that you should not have inhumane punishments is by um, implementing such punishments in you know inhumane behavior mm. uh, violence becomes normalized then we as a society become uh, desensitized to it which is not a good thing the third thing is no justice system criminal justice system mm. is infallible we have seen this everywhere right mm. and therefore imagine if someone was wrongfully convicted and you put them to death who is going to bring that person back uh, therefore, we do need to abolish the death penalty, but most governments and, you know, presidents, ministers don't seem to want it because it's a very populist thing. You can say by implementing the death penalty, we can, you know, rid the country of the menace of drugs. It's a very populist decision and we've seen even ministers and others the leader of the opposition, a lot of people who seem to support this. It is misguided, it is not based on facts, and it is not going to solve the problem. Mm. It is also an easy solution for us, because if you look at the drugs, for instance, drugs, yes. Uh, there is a problem because Sri Lanka is also a transit point. So mm. we do get a lot of drugs coming through Sri Lanka and a lot of it is seeping into the local market. Mm. But who is getting arrested? The people who use drugs are getting arrested or the people who sell drugs because they're dependent on drugs and they need to get money for their use are mm -hmm. the ones who are getting arrested. So the Even importers, the big boys? The big boys. How many big boys? How uh -huh. many of them have been arrested? How many of them are in prison? How many? No one, right? I mean, very, very few. Very, very few. We can count them on our hands. And we, we know this from other countries as well, that it's not possible to have drugs enter in such massive quantities into a country without the support of those in positions of power in the law enforcement, etc. Mm. Now, let's take the North. It was a great example for this. In the North, there is hyper-militarized there is surveillance, intimidation. If the families of the disappeared organize a protest, they get phone calls from the intel a few days prior to that asking them, now we hear you're going to protest. Why are you protesting or where are you going to protest? Now, if the military has such a level of surveillance that they have are able to ob obtain such intelligence, yeah. are you? how are you telling me that they do not know who's bringing in the drugs? They do not know who's selling the drugs? I need right? to interject there for mm -hmm. just one few nanoseconds. Yes. If the military intelligence is so jolly good at this, mm -hmm. then perhaps they can share some of their intel with the police and find what happened to Dinesh Shafter. Not only Dinesh Shafter, we also but have... I mean, yeah, because it's exactly. Exactly, exactly, right? But also we see the government using this as an excuse to militarize. Now in the North, we had the justice minister last month who visited the North. And a couple of days later, what do we find? We find an uh, increased number of military checkpoints in the North on the pretext of checking for drugs. The military is not supposed to be involved in this. Involving the military only because they don't own no law enforcement that's not their duty in a democracy and what you find is that even when you have the military involved even when they do something that is uh, not according to law the police are not going to check them because the police do defer to the military My and we suddenly also went to Welikada mm -hmm. and the the that whole the massacre the massacre exactly uh, and if you had one had left it to uh, the jailers who are trained and who know how to handle uh, their patients or their guests, if you like. Um, things may have turned out to be different, but instead we had uh, others. Mm -hmm. And the also, as, the, as the judgment says, the, the, the case, the judgment says that it came out last year. What it says is there were people who are also from the outside uh, who they don't identify, who went in and who, who assassinated the people who were in prison right and people in prison are supposed to be in the custody of the court 
and these people were assassinated. Mm -hmm. So that is that just shows <coughs> a, a very corrupt and dysfunctional system that we have here. And bringing the death penalty or bringing the military, checking children's school bags is not going to stop this. I mean, that's, it's almost ridiculous, unless, of course, they have some credible uh, evidence of some intel that these schools uh, children have been infiltrated by some drug lord. I, I don't but also there's a lot of fear mongering. You see newspapers and media quoting one <coughs> individual uh, who might say there are 12,000 children who are, you know, in uh, who have been sent to orphanages because their parents are addicted or dependent on drugs. Now, that is not based on statistics. They did not do a survey. They did not have, you know, they did not uh, base it on evidence, but yet the, the media uses this, which also creates fear and the purpose is to create fear so you can bring in more punitive laws but the people who end up going to prison or to these compulsory drug rehab which by the way does not work the government might you know like to delude themselves that it works but there is scientific evidence from other countries even from Sri Lanka which shows that compulsory drug rehab does not work you need awareness you need community based uh, support mechanisms you need what's called harm reduction Mm -hmm. techniques mm -hmm. right there are certain drugs that you give that actually uh, reduce your cravings if people are injecting drugs then in to ensure that they do not uh, pass um, you know um, to prevent the spread of mm -hmm. HIV yes. yeah. you give them clean syringes mm. so the government's attitude towards the dr towards um, dealing with the drug issue is the same when it comes to sex education it's like saying if you teach children about sex education like the hate then they will you know go out and engage in all sorts of sexual activity but what you're doing is you're putting them at risk mm. and the same kind of regressive conservative approach that is not based on science or evidence is what the government is using which is exacerbating the problem at the community level which they do not seem to be aware of or don't seem to care about uh, I, I'm gonna read another message because it's very reflective of uh, our program's title today, that credibility is king, really. More than half the cabinet ministers are having a bar license in a Buddhist country. I'd like to, say, I'd like to add, uh, edit that to a majority Buddhist country. Two, they're up to all kinds of drug trafficking, murders, etc., etc. They are dealing in ethanol. Thuggerism has become a qualification for today's politics. How can these jokers put into place law and order? Thank you for your message. But this, this is what I mean about the credibility issue. I mean, even if you take a, a broadcaster, if there is no credibility, people ain't going to watch you. You know, that, that's as simple as that. So how do the people actually force the change. Well, I mean, we had our earlier, but mm -hmm. now look what's <laughs> happened. You know, they, they've been threatened, basically, because uh, we had a spate of arrests under the PTA. And I just saw that even today, mm. there's a, a while ago, there was an arrest, apparently, for something that happened in June. Yes. And so this doesn't seem to be maintenance of law and order. It seems to be reprisals and creating a climate of fear to crack down on dissent, to prevent protests, etc. Mm. Uh, so what people need to do, I think it's at the next election. That is how they show people's power, by um, electing people who uh, are credible, who are honest, who have integrity, who are not corrupt, who don't have businesses which they use their political patronage to further, mm. um, etc. And um, also, I think, to continue to speak out, to continue to protest. And of course, many people are afraid to protest because exactly of this because of the arrests, because of the police violence. Uh, many are afraid and it's only a few that we see who are protesting. And also this myth about stability in that if we have stability and in order to have stability, we can't speak out, we can't protest, we can't mm. critique. But stability is all about creating an environment where people can safely and confidently do that. Mm. And the government is secure enough to answer that without resorting to violence. 
because resorting to violence and these punitive measures mm. to crack down on dissent only shows the insecurity of the government. Thank you, uh, Ambika Skatgulanadan. But before I leave and hand it over to the uh, primetime news team, I simply must read this message. And thank you for several messages uh, which I haven't been able to read, but they're all very important. 0772 305 The only hope for this country is to demand for a presidential election and get an intelligent, honest man or woman with integrity to contest, to have legitimacy to rule this country and then form a government with decent people. We have a man who was rejected to lead this country who only wants power for himself and cares a hoot about people or country. Ambika Satkunanadan, thank you very much for being on Newsline Live. Thank you, Varaz. We look forward to welcoming you on the network again. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the primetime news. Take care. Have a wonderful New Year as much as you can. And we hope that it is a New Year in which uh, Sri Lanka's collective troubles and crises will abate. Take care and God bless you all. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali.